Hello everyone and welcome to a design video where we talk about escape maps and one of my favorite escape chapters ever, especially in the realm of GBA ROM hacking, is Chapter 4, Looming Shadow from Road to Ruin, a Fire Emblem 7 ROM hack by Prime Fusion. This video has been something on my mind for a while. I wanted to do a bit of a breakdown of this chapter and why I find it to be easily the strongest chapter in this hack, but just a very strong chapter in general. And there's a lot of good takeaways for you to consider. And especially when it comes to escape maps, which we don't have a lot of great references for in vanilla GBA. It's not an objective that you ever see in the vanilla GBA games. And it's not really that common throughout Fire Emblem in general. There's obviously the Manster Escape in FE5, which is very well known and you know well regarded or infamous depending on your point of view. And there's also a few like arrive style chapters in Fire Emblem 9 and a few others scattered throughout the series. But I would say this chapter does a lot of things really well that I want to call out and bring notice to because I think it's something that you should consider when you're designing your own escape chapters. Honorable mentions for other good escape chapters you should reference. Um, Fire Emblem Aletheia, an FE8 ROM hack by Epicure, has a really good escape map early on. I want to say it's like chapter like three or four. It's been a while since I've played it, but it's like a nighttime field escape. It's also pretty well done. But this one's my favorite. And I have footage of it ready to go, and so I thought it would be good to talk about it. So, to give you some context, and if you've been reading along with the dialogue, story-wise, escape chapters thrive on good narrative. You need to have a reason to be escaping. I think it's one of those objectives that is harder to justify without good narrative. So the narrative that you set up will be really key to like buy into the escape and like why they would be getting chased down. Um, I think it's a really good mix-up narratively to have these types of chapters. And in Road to Ruin, to this point, to chapter four, you, as in Vance and his crew, have been mercenaries serving this guy um, from the kingdom of Axum. And then when they go to receive another job, they get betrayed, and now they're trying to escape from the castle because Vance was like, hey, I think you're doing something kind of sketchy. And here they're like, oh, you know too much. And now they're trying to escape. So... With this chapter, you see here, just from me scrolling back and forth, that there are two distinct paths to take, one with a chest, one without a chest, and you have about eight units at your disposal, two healers. You also see that you have Yorlu, the sniper boss, kind of hanging out in the top left. He doesn't move, and one thing that I will say is a weakness of this chapter is that apparently you can cheese him without a ton of difficulty. I think Skryza was the one who told me about this. Um, and that's fine. I mean... Ideally, you wouldn't be able to, but whatever. Either way, I don't think he ever moves. But you do eventually have reinforcements coming from where he is. Now, immediately, the first turn, there's stuff to attack. You have one soldier. Ideally, you'd have a little bit more. But the player is presented with a choice. You have all of your units in one group, and you can choose. Do I go down the left, do I go down the right, or do I split? Now, one advantage of splitting in this case is that... There's a door key and a chest key, and each of them are on different sides of the map. Which I thought was really clever, and a cool way to incentivize splitting, because then you get the reward in the chest. And I think the reward in the chest is something just like some gold, which is still pretty nice. But just the idea of, you know, you have to go down both paths and then meet up, and then do this type of trade maneuver to get the item, kind of at the edge of one of the paths. I thought it was really clever, it reminded me of... Kind of like the on-the-fly like trade strats you can do in Thracia that I feel like a lot of games don't really do as well. And I really like that because there is going to be good pressure coming from behind just after a few turns. So, real quick to summarize with that point, you have split paths, you have clear reasons to go down each one, and most importantly you have resources to do so. You have eight units, so you can do a four and four split, two of which are healers. Old versions of this chapter didn't have a second healer. Lenora used to not exist in older builds. And so splitting was really difficult given 
just how many units you had and how you would sponge damage. And so having the extra healer makes this a lot more feasible to do and much more fair to a blind player going in. So as you can see here, I do decide to split um, and I can just kind of fast forward a little bit so you can see here. Splitting a little bit, so I'll send Lenora, Hugo, and Vance down one side, and then Yorin, Buck, and Ava with Sylvia down the other. And you, what's nice, too, is that there's different enemies on each side as well. I think one common mistake that people make when splitting in general is that they make each side exactly the same. And this chapter does a nice job of not only differentiating the path, so it's not a symmetrical path, but also changing up the enemies. So I actually want to consider the matchups as I'm going down each path. And that's not just true for an escape map, that's just true in general. So you can see you got the door key here, which is nice, we'll want that later to open up that door. We haven't gotten any door keys up to this point. But yeah, you do wanna make sure that the enemies that you put at each side are different, so you consider those matchups and who you send where. Otherwise, splitting doesn't really matter. It's just kind of like, all right, let me just put my support partners together and then I'll go break left or right. The other thing this map does pretty well from an escape perspective is that it doesn't put a ton of pressure on the player from the front with reinforcements or just general enemy placement. You can move really fast and while, like I alluded to before, I don't love when first turns are kind of empty like you saw there was only one soldier to attack on the first turn which isn't great, but if you look further down, the way the enemies are placed, they're placed in such a way that the game is kind of pulling you in to those enemies. It's not trying to stall you. It's not trying to wall you. It's encouraging you. It's inviting you to move forward. It's saying, you're trying to escape. Let me lure you into these enemies versus I'm going to put up this defensive wall to stop you and make you play slower. Like the game is encouraging you to go fast. And... It becomes a question of how aggressive am I willing to play to achieve that goal and consider my placement and consider my matchups because I don't have a ton of units to work with. I only have so much HP to go around. I love that there's a fighter that comes from behind pretty immediately. I think that's really clever and a good use of having an enemy at the start and good use of the map space in like that top right corner to hide an enemy like that. I think that that's really good um, and just a well thought out sort of thing where there's pressure coming from behind but from a different place like you saw the reinforcements already started coming in and it's a great use of armor knights because in this hack armor knights have four move and it's nice that you know you're probably not always going to be moving your full movement but at least you know armor knights are going to be just a little bit slower than you so it's going to be kind of this like creeping sort of horror following behind you and I think that's a really good starting point to let the player know. Enemies are coming from behind. They have good weapons. I think they both have spears. But they're coming at such a pace where you can you can outrun them, but you do have to play aggressively. And the game gives you like just the right amount of wiggle room to feel both pressure but without it being unfair. Like if those armor knights came after the first turn, it would be unfair because you wouldn't have enough wiggle room between yourself and the enemies. Here, you have like some breathing space between you and the backside if you've been playing at a reasonable clip. Which, again, because of the way the enemies are placed, you likely wouldn't be stuck in that upper area unless you're playing so painfully slowly. But the game doesn't really give you a reason to play that slowly. So even if you're playing at like a turtle speed, you're probably already in this corridor. Or at least starting to get into this corridor by the time the armor knights show up. And that's enough of a signal to say, okay, let me hurry up a bit because I need to get a move on. So the timing and pacing is really key. And when you're designing an escape map, timing is so crucial. I would argue that escape maps are probably one of the most important types of objectives to like really test and get the timing down for, because so much of what makes the escape map work is timing. If you have strong reinforcements coming from behind, forcing the player forward, you need to map that out accordingly so that the player, so that you can sense, okay, the average player will likely be at this particular point. These reinforcements will show up. You kind of just need to like map this out a little bit more. Like compared to like a seize map or defeat boss map where it's usually a little bit more linear, 
and there's not as much consideration for what's coming from behind and more so just what's coming forward, there's this additional layer of complexity in the map's design. And I think this chapter is a really good job of timing it out. And you can just tell from how like tight the design is that this chapter was play tested to Helen back. And even just the addition of the second healer, which I think really specifically benefits this chapter, you could tell that Prime was really key, keen on uh, making this chapter feasible from the way he initially intended it to be played. And that second healer really helps there for encouraging the split and enabling that split. Beyond that, though, there's a couple of other things that are worth calling out in this chapter. If we scroll a little bit further down here, we'll keep going. Let's keep going. Oh, yeah, so there's a boss here. The boss moves. And what's really cool about the boss is that he charges you when you get into range. And so not and so now as you see these armor knights are starting to come in from the top. This boss is also someone that you need to keep in mind. He has a strong weapon. He can hurt you. You have to kind of plan it out. And if you've been playing at the right kind of aggressive pace, you should have some breathing room to kind of take it slow and take it in. And that's like a really good mix up, right? Because earlier as I was saying, the game's encouraging you to go fast, it's pulling you in, and then you have this tough boss to deal with who moves. And so you need to position yourself accordingly, not only to sponge the hit, but then also to deal with them quickly, because then the armor knights are coming in fast. And I really like that as a change-up from the rest of the chapter, where it's encouraging you to go faster, and this is kind of like pumping the brakes, respecting the boss a little bit, and then pushing the player forward. And then lastly, you can see here, there's the escape point. So kind of zooming back a little bit here. Um, some things I don't love about this chapter that I think are worth calling out is just the excessive amount of one tiling. There's a lot of one tile choke points in this chapter. And while it's not super egregious, it can really slow you down if you kind of get caught in the wrong place. But I do like that it also kind of creates a lot of these like over the wall two range scenarios that you need to be mindful of. And this chapter doesn't have an egregious amount of 1-2 range on the enemy side, so it's not terrible. It's really more to the benefit of the player, I think, in a lot of in a lot of ways. But just something to keep in mind when you're designing is that you want to have a little bit more open space. I think most of these choke points should be 2 wide. I don't think they need to be 1 tile wide. Maybe this one here, the Tori's flying through, could be 1 wide, but maybe that longer corridor by the chest should be 2 wide instead. Like just adding an extra space, I think, would do wonders. Um, but it does make that whole hallway a lot more critical to navigate through correctly because of the shaman that's there. And then later on when you're escaping, not having anyone hug that top wall because of the spear armor knight. So while normally I would be more like passionate about the one tile choke points, I think here it really works because it's on a small enough scale that it's not an unreasonable amount of cognitive load for the player to be aware of the one-two range through the walls here because there aren't that many enemies in the space. And... It's, again, all trying to push the player forward. You're not really taking, like, a defensive position throughout most of the map. You're really trying to, what is the safest place to advance to? And can I get there without killing myself, basically? And these one-tile choke points, I think, make it a little bit riskier to kind of go through there. But it's not the end of the world, I would say. So... I'm trying to think what else I had to say on this. I wrote a couple of things down. I don't have too much more. I think just in summary, guys, like when you're making an escape map, you got to play test it a ton. You've got to map out when should the reinforcements from behind come because you need that pressure. And I'm saying like, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You need to have some kind of pressure from from the back to make escape chapters feel like proper escape chapters. If you have an escape chapter with nothing pressuring you from the back, it's an arrive chapter. It's glorified seas. Escape has a different sort of feel to it, which is why I think it's one of my favorite objectives to play. And I think it's quite popular for those reasons. And it's that pressure that you get from the back. And it's usually one of the few times where you have like a true anti-turtle, like a punishing anti-turtle. And I find that to be um, quite interesting and underutilized a lot of the time. And escape chapters are really one of the few places where this actually works really well. If you're going to do split paths in an escape chapter, you got to make sure the player has resources to deal with it. Having, in this case, two healers is really key for making that escape chapter work. Avoiding symmetry to make the choices matter a little bit more with who you send where. 
having some type of moving boss that's not just like clogging the escape point. Like what's nice is I can skip the boss entirely and just end the chapter if I get desperate enough. But I probably want that boss experience and he's charging at me. And so I have an opportunity to deal with him. But I also have an opportunity to run away. And so giving the player that choice as well, I think is really good in an escape chapter because otherwise it's just kind of like the boss sits on the escape point and you have to deal with it. In some cases you might want that narratively, but I like in this case that Reese is just sitting on his pillar, but he'll he'll move if you get close. And I like that because what it's doing is pressuring the player, pumping the brakes a little bit, and then giving you the choice. Like, do I try and take a little bit of my time to get this guy out of the way, or do I just run? And that's really key here to consider. Do I just get out of here? And you have that choice versus having to kill him and take his throne spot. And I think a lot of like the FE9 Arrive chapters are like that, where it's like the boss kind of sits on the spot, and it's like, okay, dude, this is just like thematically free skin sees as Buck gets a bad level up. So keep that in mind as well. How the enemies move, the pacing of the map, and most importantly, just like the pressure that you're putting on front. Like you saw there were a few reinforcements that came from the front, like towards where the player would be going. And that's fine. I would say most escape chapters, you're going to have most of the reinforcements come from the back. If you do have reinforcements coming from in front of the player, it should be timed in such a way that it doesn't spawn on top of them. And it makes sense. Like having enemies spawn from the bottom right corner does make sense because it is implied that there's more to this castle than we can see. If they were to spawn like in a space where it felt like I'm in a hallway or they're spawning on top of you, that's not great. So knowing the pacing of the chapter is important not only for knowing when to introduce the hurry up reinforcements from the back, but also some additional enemies from the front. And it's key to not put too many enemies up front because again, you want to pull the player forward, not like push them to stay in place in an escape chapter. And that sort of subtle element of flow, really key to making the escape chapter work well. And this chapter, I had so much fun playing it, both times I played through Road to Ruin, and it really stands out to me as just the best chapter in the hack, in terms of its pacing, in terms of its objective, in terms of just how it plays out. It just does so many things right that really, you know, kind of speak to how I like to play Fire Emblem. And so I did want to take a couple of minutes to talk about it, why I thought it was good, and things you can consider when you're making your own escape map. So I hope this was helpful, guys. And happy making escape maps. We're looking forward to hearing what sort of maps you guys make. And if they can be as close to being as good as this one, I think you're in good shape. So keep these things in mind. I apologize for my ramblings, but I hope it's helpful. And I will see you next time.